Hello, this is Reb Brad. You're listening to the From the Touchline podcast. We're coming closer to the end of our special podcast series here during the season of Advent. Christmas is drawing ever nearer. Since the 8th century, the church has been singing the O Antiphons. The O Antiphons are so named as each line begins with an O. Perhaps the most famous of these are the words in verse which begins, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Now an antiphon is a short sentence or a phrase which is sung or recited before or after a psalm or canticle. Altogether, there are seven antiphons. These are usually sung in the evening, each antiphon getting its own special time for pause and reflection, and all this happening in the week leading up to Christmas. In a moment, I'll share a short reflection, and then the antiphon will be read and then sung. Feel free to sing along or to simply listen to what Jesus is saying to you during this season of Advent. few days of Advent, and we come to the sixth and next to last Advent antiphon. The words go like this, O come, desire of nations bind, all peoples in one heart and mind. Bid thou our sad division cease, and be thyself our King of Peace. Could there be a more timely or appropriate title for Messiah, for Savior, someone that we could call on, cry out to, for coming into our world today? Think of the wars that are raging right now. Consider the divisions that so many people are experiencing over politics, over ideologies, and more. The whole world feels like it's on a knife's edge of tension, needing just one little push or nudge to make it all boil over and become like a volcanic eruption. Desire of Nations. It's a curious title. As a Christian, I've come to understand this to be Jesus. The ancient Hebrew prophet Haggai used a similar phrase and title when he was writing and speaking to the exiles of Israel. You can find it in Haggai chapter 2, verse 7. You see, originally God had intended for his people, for Israel, to be set apart and to be so different and unique that the nations would be drawn to these people of God. Certainly, there are many occasions where we can see this, where the nations have come from outside to wonder, to explore, to begin to worship, to follow the one true God of the Hebrews. But Haggai's words do more in chapter 2, verse 7, than speak to this sort of attractiveness that will happen after the exile to Babylon. His prophetic words foreshadow one who is to come, someone who will draw all manner of people unto himself. Jesus himself attested to this. The Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 32 Jesus speaks of his coming death, and in the presence of some Greek Gentile believers, he makes his particular claim. He says, But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. <laughs> now let's be honest for a second. There are many in the, in the world who don't want Jesus. So how can we call him desired of nations? Long ago, St. Augustine of Hippo wrote in his Confessions, you made us for yourself, and our hearts will be restless until it rests in you. Augustine there is speaking about God. He'd come out from his own conversion story to realize that there's a restlessness, a dissatisfaction that the human heart has in trying to find things other than God to take the place which God rightfully commands and demands of us and demands of our hearts and our lives. 17th century French mathematician and philosopher Blaise Pascal once commented in his work, The Pensies. He wrote this. He says, What else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but that there was once in man a true happiness, of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace? This he tries in vain 
to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there the help he cannot find in those that are. Though none can help, since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object, in other words, by God himself. Pascal's writing and thought here is often quoted and paraphrased. Uh, m- many people will describe it as this God-shaped hole or this God-shaped vacuum. You see, there's this space inside of us, inside of a human being, a longing, a desire. It can only be satisfied by God himself. Nowadays, we might hear a common saying, you know what you know. It's a reference point that sometimes we're naive or we simply don't know what is better or what is best. Our knowledge is limited by our circumstance, our education, our experience. But we do know that God has made himself known to us in a variety of ways. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, we can feel it. Paul writes to Christians in Rome. He says, you know, what could be known about God is plain. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, divine nature, these things have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. That's in Romans 1, 19 through 20. You know, I say, if, if we're honest with ourselves, in the deepest part of ourselves, in the hidden way parts, maybe the things we've tried to bury or keep covered, we all know something isn't right. We know that this world is in horrible shape. There has to be something better. There must be someone better. There's a longing and desire in us for wars to cease, for violence and pain and death to come to an end, for us to be united in our lives, to be connected to others, to to stop fighting with each other, for us to come together with a king of peace. And so we say, O come, desire of nations, Put us together. Unite us once again. Make us whole again. O King, whom all the peoples desire, you are the cornerstone which makes all one. O come and save us, whom you made from clay. O come, desire of nations, bind all peoples in one heart and mind. Bid thou our sad divisions cease, and be thyself our King of Peace. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Self our key.